Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the lecture series of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. It's my pleasure to be here to welcome Keith Feldman and Emily Drumsta. Uh, Keith is an assistant professor of ethnic studies here at Berkeley. Emily is a PhD candidate in the Department of Comparative Literature. Keith received his PhD from the University of Washington in 2008 and came to UC Berkeley soon after. His research focuses on connections between U.S. imperial culture and its changing geopolitical engagements with North Africa, the Middle East, uh, the Arab and the Muslim worlds, particularly Israel-Palestine. His latest book, Special Relationships, Israel-Palestine and U.S. imperial culture, will be published by the University of Minnesota Press, hopefully in the near future. Uh, in addition to various other projects, he is also working on uh, a republication of David Graham's uh, uh, the Boys is, and Bid Him Sing, 1975, an autobiographical novel about the cultural practices of black radicalism in Cairo in the 1960s. Uh, Emily is a PhD candidate whose area of focus is modern Arabic literature, particularly its representation of mourning, loss, and trauma. Her uh, dissertation, Broken Narratives, the Poetics of Metification in Algeria and Palestine addresses the documentation of catastrophe in contemporary novels from North Africa to the Middle East. Uh, she worked with Keith on translating documents from the uh, Maj Zuhur camp in Lebanon, and in fact today that is what they will talk to us about. Please welcome both of them to see you. Hi, welcome. It's great to see everybody. Um, and the, the craziness of uh, Berkeley silos. I've been here since 2009, and this is my first time in this really beautiful space. And I'm so thrilled to, uh, to have the opportunity to present a little bit of this work. So thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and also, I want to uh, acknowledge a grant from the Committee on Research uh, here at Berkeley that has a program uh, for uh, RAs in the humanities. Uh, and it's this program that uh, enabled me to bring Emily onto this project uh, to do the really uh, important translation work that you'll see is so central to it. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. Well, I want to start today uh, with an epigraph from a February 1993 column entitled Islam and the USA Today, written by UC Berkeley's own African-American studies professor, poet, and essayist, June Jordan. So Jordan writes in this essay, quote, On barren land between Lebanon and Israel, 400 men arrived in winter and emptiness. They'd been blindfolded and pushed into buses that traveled through the darkness with illegal speed. They had been seized inside their homes and driven away at gunpoint into sudden, unimaginable exile. From, there, uh, from their enemies, each of them received a blanket, a paper bag of food, and $50. They are Palestinians. Most are Muslims. They may not survive. No man can live on no man's land." End quote. Now, it's rare, indeed, to find ground unclaimed by sovereign powers, ground unincorporated into the territorial ambit of the nation state. What we want to do today is to kind of take up this blank spot on the map, this so-called no man's land, and to address the culture work that makes it legible to us, and the performative and kind of documentary practices of living in this no man's land. Uh, the space that we're talking about was about six miles wide between the Zamaria checkpoint, marking the beginning of Israel's security belt in southern Lebanon, and the Lebanese village of Marj al Zahur. Now, June Jordan's brief summary of events is largely quite accurate. Over the course of a few weeks in December 1992, members of the militant Izzedin al Qasim martyrs' brigades had claimed responsibility for killing a number of Israeli soldiers and took hostage an Israeli border security agent. The terms of the agent's return included the release from prison of Hamas's spiritual leader, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. 
When Israel refused Yassin's release, the brigades killed the security agent. And when his body was found, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin received um, a full Knesset approval to order the large-scale detention and deportation of Palestinians with purported affiliations to Hamas. Over 1,500 Palestinians were rounded up in the West Bank and Gaza, and over 400, many of whom were actually removed from administrative detention, were slated for deportation. This strategy aimed to enable the continuation of peace negotiations between Israel and the PLO that would result in the Oslo Accords, a set of negotiations that Hamas, of course, refused to accept precisely on the grounds that the forms of Palestinian sovereignty on the table were incommensurate with the desires for their expression of Palestinian freedom. Now, were this strategy of deportation and kind of abandonment in no man's land to have succeeded, the ultimate agent kind of responsible for the deportees' removal from the vicinity of Israel would have been the inhuman extra-political forces. Right, the natural environment of extreme cold, snow, and mountainous terrain. But the over 400 deportees, among them imams, professors, doctors, lawyers, and students, ranging in age from 17 to 62, after they were deposited on the far side of Israeli security belt and marched for several miles towards Lebanese sovereign territory, they decided to stay put. Many of them, including prominent members of the Palestinian leadership of Hamas, but also including journalists and students, stayed put for the better part of one year. They used that ground as a stage to perform, to document, to visualize their human status. They built a library, a university, a cafeteria. They commanded the attention of what ended up being a largely sympathetic news media and they produced over 30 published works, most of them taking their experiences at Marjol Zufour as a point of departure for documentation and critical and imaginative writing alike. So among those pu publications were collections of poetry and a kind of yearbook about which Emily and I will really focus our remarks on today. Now these remarks are part of a, a larger research project that uh, I've been embarking on as I've been finishing up my first. And this is on the circuits of literary and visual culture during what we might think of as the long war on terror. That is roughly from about 1980 to the present. In the project, I'm interested in investigating how contemporary Palestinian, US, and Israeli literary and visual culture innovates, consolidates, and contests processes of racialization. And I turn to race in particular, in part because I'm in ethnic studies and we talk often about race, but also I think for some really helpful analytical reasons. Right? I turn to race in particular as a way to understand the suture between the seen and the known as well as to think about the cultural practices that help us to envision both the present and the future. Race helps us to understand the suture between the seen and the known. So building on recent scholarship in critical human geography, critical race theory, and visual culture studies, I aim to chart how visual and literary cultural producers articulate and re-articulate race as what Laura Pulido would call a dynamic socio-spatial process, something that traverses local, national, and imperial geographies. And for me in this project, key coordinating concepts are things like the border, the prison, and the drone. Now I'm especially interested in how the kind of future anterior grammar, the will-have-been grammar of speculation provide something like a temporal frame for the race-making work of the War on Terror, as well as its horizon for political contestation and imagination. I think this mode of seeing, this kind of future anterior, this will-have-been sense, 
draws upon what Alan Feldman, in a relation, calls an actuarial gaze. Feldman describes an actual aerial gaze like this. It's a visual organization and institutionalization of threat perception and prophylaxis. End quote. So this visual regime, this actuarial gaze, abstracts the production and management of modernity's long sedimented, long sedimented force relations, what we might think of as the domain of race, into categories of risk, calculability, and rationality that underwrite the security state's violence. The war on terror's speculative regimes attempting to capture what will have been, right, or what might have been, these seize upon and attempt to make seeable the imminent, probable, the possible, even as speculative and documentary works of image making problematize, re-articulate, and redirect such optical investments. Right? So there's uh, a dialectic that I'm trying to chart out uh, around speculation and vision. Now in my first book-length project slated for publication next spring, I'm pleased to report, um, I address an earlier conjuncture, namely the 60s, 70s, and early 80s where the kind of cultural traffic between the US, Israel, and Palestine was thick and fast. In that book, I analyzed the culture work that mediated the coupling between American logics of de jure ethno-racial inclusion and Israel's increasingly permanent racialized logics of occupation and settlement right, in Palestinian territories. And I try to demonstrate how the kind of persistent racialized exclusion of Palestinian, uh, of, of Zionism's others rather, both in historic Palestine and in the diaspora, rarely posed a contradiction to the kind of incorporative racial logics of American liberal democracy. Right? You could have uh, a logic of racial inclusion in the United States that at the same time refused to countenance uh, a complex Palestinian subjectivity. Right? And so I hone in on selected moments of contestation around this kind of exclusion. And I look in particular at the circulation of knowledge by Arab and Arab American scholars, culture workers, and organizations in doing so. So for those who are interested, in part why I bring this up here, um, the Institute for International Studies is hosting a public manuscript mini-conference on May 5th to work through a kind of near final draft of the manuscript. And I'd be happy to pass along information for anyone who'd like to attend and participate. So now in the follow-up to this project, I'm interested in, in engaging more directly with how the infrastructure, effects, and culture work of Israeli occupation serves as kind of a laboratory for liberal democracies, biopolitical regimes of rule. Right. And I'm also interested in, a, again, a kind of dialectical fashion with those practices of critique and resistance whose point of departure is precisely that laboratory. And in recent years, a number of political theorists, human geographers, and anthropologists have begun addressing how an Israeli biopolitical apparatus is fashioned through linking law and space. We can turn to recent edited collections, such as Givani et al.'s The Power of Inclusive Exclusion, uh, and Ronit Lenten's edited collection Thinking Palestine, alongside individual works by Derek Gregory, A.L. Weitzman, Stephen Graham, David Theo Goldberg, Ashim Mbembe, among others. Each of these thinkers in various kinds of ways draws inspiration from the work of Italian political philosopher Giorgio Agamben. And it's with Agamben that I want to sit for a few minutes, because Agamben himself ends up sitting with Marshall Zapur. Now the basic contours of this argument uh, will likely be familiar. Israel, it is said, garners its sovereign power through its capacity to produce kind of spatialized zones, racialized populations, and political subjects that are enfolded into the juridical order only through their withdrawal right, from the tapestry of legal protections. 
These kind of spatialized zones, populations, and political subjects come to exemplify the figures, hominis sacri, and bare life, whose exposure to premature death goes unpunished. This theorization finds a kind of empirical purchase in the carceral geography of Israeli occupation, one that's predicated on producing divisions, walls, fissures, disruptions, isolations, and the like, whose permanently temporary status is seen to disable, disarticulate, and disrupt practices of Palestinian sovereignty, the expression of communal life worlds, and the, the calibration of a national economy. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Agamben draws from Foucault to theorize the liberal state's capacity to make live and let die, right? how this produces biopolitical zones of abandonment that nevertheless wield with impunity the sovereign right of the state to kill. This marks the insertion of what Foucault would call state racism, where the apparatus of warfare that produces enemy others from without, those kinds of populations under modernity that have long traveled under the sign of racial difference, these are then enfolded into the social fabric as a warrant for the permanent enactment of a kind of adversarial relationship. In further laying out his argument, Agamben turns to a genealogy already crafted by Hannah Arendt. Arendt makes visible how the rights-based frameworks coupling the territorial ambit of the state to the political life of the nation produces a form of subjectivity that of necessity warrants a kind of a priori and always already figure right, without the right to have rights. And that is for Agamben, as for Arendt, the figure of the refugee. The refugee becomes the kind of paradigmatic figure. And this brings us back to Marge Alzabur. In his 1993 essay, entitled We Refugees, Agamben begins to explicate the critical apparatus that will be most fully pronounced in his later works on bare life. Here, Agamben utilizes the figure of the refugee to speculate on a different kind of post-sovereign political actor. He argues that, quote, until the process of the dissolution of the nation state and its sovereignty has come to an end, the refugee is the sole category in which it's possible today to perceive the forms and limits of a political community to come. Now, Agamben explicitly recalibrates Arendt's formative work right, for a post-Cold War conjuncture. Right? He draws first from her brief 1943 essay, also entitled We Refugees, and then from her influential kind of expansion of that argument in her chapter on, from Origins of Totalitarianism. But Agamben's embrace of the figure of the refugee as a kind of Political, a paradigmatic political subject is situated in a nascent post-Cold War cartography. He charts the moment as signaling the possibility of a violent recasting of political boundaries that would drive upwards of 20 million immigrants from the former Soviet bloc to what he calls Europe's advanced industrial states. In Agamben's poetics of a different kind of future, where the kind of, quote, permanently resident mass of non-citizens, end quote, does not refresh logics of encampment or genocide so central to European modernity, the political subjects figured as refugees do transformative work. They do work to dislodge and deconstruct what uh, Agamben calls the kind of symbolic trinity of state, nation, and territory as the grounds on which a political imaginary might operate. Now, crucially, Agamben's political cartography draws on Israel-Palestine. It's kind of a fascinating moment at the end of this We Refugees essay. For Agamben, Israel-Palestine provides a laboratory for a future-oriented European political imaginary. First, it arrives uh, in Agamben's essay in the image of Jerusalem. Agamben glimpses the potential of Jerusalem as an undivided city that might serve as the capital for two different states. He writes, quote, 
A future Jerusalem with its overlapping and reciprocal extraterritorialities could serve as a model for imagining an alternate political cartography in Europe in which all residents of the European states, citizens and non-citizens, would be in a position of exodus or refuge. And the status of the European would mean the citizens being in exodus." Unquote. So here, a kind of post-Soviet Europe might draw political inspiration from the idea of Jerusalem as a site whose shared sovereignty, shared between Israel, Palestine, and perhaps a kind of uh, international uh, body as well, would of necessity underwrite a kind of inclination to this kind of permanent condition of exodus. Right? Much more could be said, I think, about the theological imaginary right, that figures a Jerusalem to come as the horizon of a broad political possibility. Right? We have uh, plenty of examples of the use of Jerusalem to come to sort of um, catalyze our uh, political vocabularies. But importantly, the essay concludes by turning to Mukhayam al auda the camp of return, Marj al -Zuhur. And this is how the essay ends. Quote, As I write this essay, 425 Palestinians expelled from the state of Israel find themselves in a sort of no man's land. These men certainly constitute, according to a rent suggestion, quote, the vanguard of their people. But that is so not necessarily or not merely in the sense that they might form the originary nucleus of a future national state, or in the sense that they might solve the Palestinian question in a way just as insufficient as the way in which Israel has solved the Jewish question. Rather, the no man's land in which they are refugees has already started from this very moment to act back onto the territory of the state of Israel by perforating it and altering it in such a way that the image, the image, the image of that snowy mountain has become more internal to it than any other region of Eretz Israel. Only in a world in which the spaces of states have been thus perforated and topologically deformed, and in which the citizen has been able to recognize the refugee that he or she is, only in such a world is the political survival of humankind today thinkable." End quote. We'll come back to this really fascinating, kind of amazing, amazing image of the staging, right, the, the media staging, of putting the suffering of the deportees in the documentary frame of the camera. Now, well-founded critiques of Agamben's Eurocentrism have proliferated in recent years, and I, I think they are well-founded. One need only recall the genealogy of European imperialism that informed Arendt's critique of the conflation of the human and the citizen to, de to adequately demonstrate that the modernity Agamben inscribed was constituted through rubrics, racialized rubrics of coloniality right, that were animated uh, that animated its differential valuing of certain populations over others. That is to say, these were practices of everyday violence that rather than operating as exceptions to juridical norms, were inscribed precisely through them. As black studies scholar Alexander Wehelia notes, for example, quote, because black suffering figures in the domain of the mundane, it refuses the idiom of exception." or indeed, kind of in another idiom, following Walter Benjamin, we come to see via the tradition of the oppressed how the state of exception functions as a rule. But what interests me here, though, is how centrally Israel-Palestine enter into Agamben's theoretical apparatus, with the high-profile image of Marjal Zuhur providing a kind of imaginative touchstone from which Agamben's argument proceeds. What matters for Agamben are the kind of abstracted political questions produced by the act of deportation and encampment that garnered a broad global audience. But it's precisely in the practice of encampment 
And I think in the performative, poetic, and kind of documentary practice stage for this global audience, that the men in Lukain al Auda garner their own visibility. So the deportation provided the conditions of possibility to congregate people and ideas that had otherwise been corded off from one another. The deportees, those who had been literally abandoned right, in a zone of indistinction, in fact refused their conversion into hominisakri, into bare life, to life that can be exposed to premature death with impunity. In fact, they could not be exposed to premature death with impunity. That was the, um, the surprising effect right, of their claiming this no man's land. They perform a mode of life that made visible their exposure to premature death and turned their practices of survival amidst that exposure precisely into the condition that warranted their human status writ large. The deportees utilized technologies of mediation to be seen and heard beyond the bounds of the prevailing Islamophobic and Orientalist frames. The concentrated attention on Hamas leadership, this is where Rantisi and Dwek and Farrar and Ismail Haniya, etc., are all present here. Right? The concentrated attention on the leadership worked to produce a counter-sovereignty, what we might think of perhaps as a counter-sovereignty that disrupted the dominant statehood logics being rolled out as part of the peace process. In other words, the deportees enacted a kind of counter-sovereign performance from a very particular zone of indistinction, this no man's land between Israel and Lebanon, a space over which neither party claimed jurisdiction. Mukhaim al-Awda end ended up serving for the year that it was inhabited as a catalyst for the growth and visibility of Hamas, garnering opportunities for conversation and collaboration between attorneys, doctors, professors, university students, and imams that had heretofore been highly restricted and regulated by Israel's carceral practices in the West Bank and Gaza. And it's the, the practice of documentary self-expression in particular that uh, I really want us to focus the balance of our attention on. At least 19 writers produced at least 30 books while they were <coughs> present um, in Marshall's report. And all but two of these were about life on the camp. They were in included several collections of poetry, about which we'll hear a little bit more in a moment. I want to focus our attention on this kind of interesting yearbook. Uh, that was written by Saeed Malawi, Ma a uh, Lebanese journalist who also lived in the camp, uh, claims every day, uh, uh, while the deportees were there, entitled The Eagles of Marshal Zippur, The Daily Struggles of the Palestinian Deportees in Words and Images. I think this text provides a useful way to see how such an embodied practice was documented and circulated. And the book is, in fact, literally filled with documentation. It includes chapters on the dramatic sequence of events that kind of um, provides a narrative of the um, roundup, uh, putting on buses, traveling through the night, going over the border, etc. There's the administrative organization of the camp. The deportees' cultural and athletic activities are documented the deportees' social and political position, and interviews with the press. It also includes um, small portraits of all the deportees. And this is just a snapshot of one of the two of the facing pages. Small portraits of the deportees <coughs> that give their name and their place of residence. I want to take a moment more with the photographs before turning it over to Emily, who will discuss the poetry. And these images, I think, offer us a kind of visual poetics of displacement. They enact a kind of documentary practice of steadfastness, of smooth, right, that troubles the Islamophobic and racist frames that heretofore had kind of refused to countenance Muslim Palestinians as human subjects in the West. So, for example, a camera crew from the television channel CNN International 
photographs and transmits live television from the camp. This was an important step, for it put the suffering of the deportees in the documentary frame of the camera. There are over 225 photographs in the book that document a wide array of activities, practices, and modes of being. Some of them show the tasks of self-care in the camp. Washing, cooking, eating, cleaning, sometimes alone, but sometimes in groups. <coughs> There's the documentation of recreational activities, including one series of photos that shows the camp's soccer team competing against the local village's team. And you can see uh, the lower left, uh, the Marshals of Lord team uh, won a trophy. There are kind of more uh, poetic images right, where the caption emphasizes the continuity between the deportees' displacement and dispossession and the broader Palestinian history of displacement. Right, where we have a line from uh, Mahmoud Darwish. My homeland is not a suitcase. Riding Zaput dreams of his homeland. There are also images depicting really interesting political action meant to signify the men's own humanity, that they are family members. Quote, we are human beings and we have children. And in Arabic and also in English, right in front of the television camera. They wrote their names of their children, the dates of their birth, and place where they live on balloons before setting out on a march in the direction of Minos province, where they eventually released the balloons. This is, this is a political performance. They released the balloons into beautiful weather. A sudden wind blew and carried them toward Palestine whose armistice lines lay about 32 kilometers in the distance. The Israeli forces were then ordered to fire at the balloons with different bullets, exploding them in the air so that they wouldn't enter Palestine. Another interesting series of photos documents the performance of a political act condemning the UN Security Council for not effectively enforcing Resolution 799. This was a resolution passed hours after the deportation, calling on Israel to uh, ret return the deportees immediately to their homes. Uh, this was uh, an act that the Security Council could not actually enforce. So the body, uh, I assume the body of the Se Security Council's uh, credibility is placed in a grave specially prepared for it, so that it might be a witness to international slackness in the face of Israeli superiority, the last nail in the coffin of international agreements regarding the so-called law of human rights. There are numerous photographs of the university and a whole other publication, in fact, that documents the work of the university. Right? The courses that were offered, the agreements that the university made, with um, uh, educational institutions in the West Bank and Gaza to offer students credit for their time at the university. The university that united everybody, professors and students. There's documentation of the camp's library. Quote, the library tent contained more than 1,500 religious, philosophical, political, and literary books. It was one of their most significant accomplishments. The week before the deportees returned, its contents were distributed to a number of Lebanese and Palestinian libraries. There are several images of <coughs> the many, many press conferences uh, that Rantisi gave, right? over 1,500 interviews with the press, not including telephone calls from all over the world, to which he responded day and night. And there's documentation of the successful passage um, after the signing of the Oslo Accords in September, October, November uh, of 93, of the successful passage of this group of deportees through the Zomari crossing 
and the unmaking of the camp's kind of ad hoc facilities. So <clears throat> this abstract kind of no man's land became the site that perforated Israeli sovereignty, in Agamben's words, precisely by these men staging their practices of an embodied poetics that changed the frame of how Palestinians, especially Palestinian Muslims, were being viewed globally. And here I'll turn it over to Emily to talk a little bit about the poetry that does this work. Um, great, okay, so before I start and while I get this set up, I just wanted to say that um, well, I guess I'll first say thank you to the Center for Religious Studies for having me uh, here and uh, allowing me to speak with um, Keith. And I also want to thank Keith for bringing me on to this um, great project. The second thing I want to say as I open this is that I noticed a thing um, in a translation thing that I didn't catch, so I'm going to say it now so that you don't catch me on it. Um, the documentary frame of the camera, mm. so the, the um, pictures is the book that I worked on kind of the quickest, so I didn't pre-read it as, as well as I should. Um, the Arabic actually said like, Ma'asat al-Mubaradin fi itari ha al-Hafiqi. I thought that was the frame of the camera, but it actually should say something more like putting their suffering in the correct frame, considering it in the correct frame. So I apologize for that. <laughs> I didn't know that that, that, the, no, that particular collection was going to be. But it's, it's still, I mean, it still holds the, the idea of the frame being there. The connection holds, even though it's not there in the language. So I apologize for that slip up, and I have said it. And, um, okay, so. Um, okay, great. So, um, when I first sat down to translate the volumes of poetry from Maurice Zuhur that I'll be t discussing today, I have to admit that I was somewhat disappointed. Given the exciting title of Professor Feldman's project, The Poetics of Displacement, and the radical politics of the critics and theorists who led him to it, I was hoping to encounter wild formal experimentation and strikingly creative imagery, new voices wrapped around new configurations of sound and meaning. What I found instead were poems composed in the conventional Khalilian meters and filled with images well known to anyone familiar with the Arabic literary heritage. The glory of war, praise of God, Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, the sanctity of martyrs' blood, etc., etc. This was hardly the free verse of figures like Badr Shirk al Sayyab and Nazik al Malaika, nor did it incorporate any of the playful and sometimes iconoclastic reconfigurations of tradition undertaken by figures such as Adonis and Mahmoud Darwish, among others. Um, instead, it seemed extracted from a previous age, an age in which poetry served to record and transmit historical events, rather than to offer, it, offer its readers or listeners a novel aesthetic experience. Nevertheless, as I slowly progressed through the collections from Marjorie Zahur, I came to appreciate the sociological and historical, as opposed to merely aesthetic, value that inheres in this work. Abundant footnotes explaining the occasions on which particular poems were read to large crowds of deportees. Narrative accounts of specific protest marches and aggressions experienced at the hands of Israeli border police. Personal meditations on the joy of receiving letters from loved ones. All of these features illustrate the extent to which the poetry of Madre Zahur is dedicated to historical documentation and self-assertion more than it is to revolutionizing the literary edifice of modern historical poetry. In fact, it couldn't really care less about that edifice. Rather, it adheres to the oft-cited pre-modern adage that, quote, poetry is the register of the Arabs, as she in Arab. The poets of Madre Zahur envisioned a world in which poetry continues to serve this purpose, recording and transmitting that which the pictures of history seek to erase. In the brief time I have today, I will address some recurring themes, images, figures, and tropes in the two collections of, of poetry I've translated thus far. Blazing Ears of Wheat by Joel Bahar, or the Sanev in Arabic, and The Pulse of Madri Zahur, Nawadat fi Madri Zahur, by Muhammad Fuad, Fuad Abu Zaid. I will cite specific examples where I can, pointing out the similarities and differences between these two collections, 
And finally, I will share some longer excerpts that I find particularly compelling in order to give you a more specific and detailed taste of what exactly a poetics of displacement might look like. Ultimately, I hope to show that for the deportees <coughs> of Marge Zahur, at least, the poetics of displacement is equally a poetics of documentation, an insistence that these stories be incorporated into the larger narrative of Palestinian resistance. So one element that's common to both Blazing Ears of Wheat and Pulse of Mantra Zahur is the abundance of occasional poems in both collections. This is true particularly in Bahar's collection, where almost every poem has a lengthy footnote explaining the event that inspired its composition and the circumstances in which it was recited. Some of the occasional poems in both collections commemorate the celebration of Muslim holidays in the marches of War Camp. Bahar's poem, Jerusalem and the Nocturnal Journey of Isra al-Quds, for example, honors the holiday of the Isra and Mi'raj, that is, the Prophet Muhammad's legendary ascent from the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem and his nocturnal journey through the heavens. But in honoring the holiness of Jerusalem, Bahar also bemoans his distance from the city, turning the commemoration of a collective holiday into an occasion for personal lament. There's a lot of slides with a lot of text in this. I'm sorry if it's too much to take in, we can go back. Um, so Bahar writes, I long for our Aqsa, for our homeland, and longing grows truer with the protection of perseverance. O oh Lord, Jerusalem is a pain in our viscera, and in our eyes the soil of the homeland is a bouquet of flowers. So protect its mosques and open the paths that lead to it. Protect the road, for our home is calling us. Abu Zaid also has a poem, so Abu Zaid and Bahar are the two different poets. Abu Zaid also has a poem commemorating the Isra and Yaraj, titled Jerusalem is in our hearts, Al-Quds Al-Qulubina. It is a free verse poem that includes the repeated refrain, quote, Jerusalem is in our history, Jerusalem is in our eyes, Jerusalem is in our blood, and the Aqsa Mosque sustains our life like a heart, such is our belief. Bahar's collection also includes a poem he recited at a Ramadan celebration in the camp, while Abu Zaid's includes one commemorating the Hijra, or the Prophet's journey from Mecca to Medina. These holiday works not only serve to mark the passage of time in the camp, underscoring the length of the deportees' exile, which lasted over a year, they also attempt to integrate the deportees' experience into the shared fabric of the passage of time, asserting a spiritual connection to family, loved ones, and the community of the faithful as a whole, where a physical connection was impossible. Other occasional poems in Ears of Wheat and Pulse commemorate occasions specific to Marja Zahul, such as Bahar's poem honoring a delegation from Sudan who visited the camp, or Abu Zaid's free verse poem marking the one-month anniversary of the deportation. Both collections include poems that were recited at the opening of the university in the camp, and both end with valedictory poems dedicated to the first group of deportees who returned to the occupied Palestinian territories. These valedictory poems were undoubtedly recited at a farewell event, and they are notable for their contrast. Where Bahar stresses the bittersweet nature of the moment, happiness for those who are returning, sadness for those who must remain behind, Abu Zaid turns the occasion into a moment for moral, refle moral reflection and improvement. So here are Bahar's lines. Quote, though the traveling party may be delighted to return, both they and we taste sadness at our separation from each other. At such moments of farewell, how many suppressed smiles we have seen burning with tears. In saying farewell to them, our tears articulated what even the most eloquent rhetoricians are unable to say." Bahar's valedictory ode to melancholy stands in contrast with Abu Zaid's more admonishing lines in his valediction poem to the homeland, Ila al So he says, quote, my brother, do not look on your return as a hardship or an end to your happy travels. Exile serves as a university for a tribe who followed the merciful in all things. We lived through it, and its many great ordeals strengthened our commitment to the all-seeing. There's a slight difference there, sorry. Um, in composing these poems and reciting them on the day of their colleagues' return, Bahar and Abu Zaid simultaneously expressed their personal emotions and marked the occasion publicly recording it for posterity and inscribing it in a larger history of the camp. Their poems simultaneously give expression to emotion and record a historical event that would otherwise go neglected. 
Abouzi provides some of the more gripping narrative accounts of how the deportees were brought to Madras of old and the harsh living conditions they endured once they got there. These accounts are always interlaced with a moral message about how the deportees' faith in God gave them strength and forbearance. In the long narrative poem, The Call of the Deportees, Nadat al Mukhradin, for example, Abu Zaid writes, They set up camps on the naked land and refused to live like chased off refugees. They resolved to remain in the craggy hills with willpower amply provided by their Lord. Their skin stings with the bitter cold, but their slogans, such as the will of God, remain assured. Food was scarce, but still their voices repeated, God is great, our resolve will never die. Their fuel depleted, but never their resolve, while snow clouds gathered and loomed above them. Surrounded by mountain peaks on every side, like the mountains, their resolve grew solid. They were the choicest men from the land of our Aqsa Mosque, from which Muhammad, the greatest of all men, ascended. They have all been blessed by their submission to God, mobilized as soldiers following the infringement of their rights." Bahar, meanwhile, includes several poems dedicated to the memory of specific fighters from the Wazidin al Qasam brigades, the military wing of Hamas, um, and the fighters Bahar memorializes were martyred during operations in Gaza and elsewhere. So these are like specific occasions to the camp, right, as opposed to larger collective holidays. From marking the celebration of religious holidays to documenting major events in the camp's one-year history, and from expressing solidarity with fighters in Gaza to commemorating the opening of the camp's university, the occasional poems from Blazing Ears of Wheat and The Pulse of Madras of Old illustrate the extent to which these collections are intended as a register or duen of the deportees' experience of exile in southern Lebanon. While the occasional poems I have just mentioned affirm and document the community's presence despite attempts to erase it, some of the less conventional poetry in both collections comprises personal reflections on the feeling of receiving letters from one's family. In fact, the commonality of this very specific theme to both collections is quite noteworthy. In his footnote to the poem titled, An Inspiration Appeared, Wahi Atullah, Bahar informs the reader that he composed this poem, quote, after receiving some letters from his family, end quote. In the poem, he describes the way the letters lifted him from the depths of sadness and compares them to fragrant perfumes and copiously watered gardens. Quote, melancholically I submerge myself in sadness and see sorrow embracing my heart, until I saw refreshment in written form, like a sweet fragrance perfuming the horizon. Those who used alphabets of light to create hope for us are like a radiant illumination. O oh, you who poured out generosity into lines of text with alphabets of copiously watered flowers, the aroma of musk emanated from a page that carried all of your passions, exhaling them fragrantly. I sang out with delight like a bird, and the pages buoyed up my heart with perfume." End quote. Meanwhile, in the headnote to his poem, A Greeting and a Command, Tahiya wa Wasiya, rhyme totally lost in English, sorry, <laughs> Abu Zaid explains that the poem is intended as, quote, a letter to my children and grandchildren in the homeland, in which the names of all my children and grandchildren appear, end quote. This includes Abu Zaid's two sons and eight daughters, along with 16 grandchildren. Throughout the poem, Abu Zaid plays on the literal meanings of the children's Arabic names, a feat of wordplay that was impossible to translate without abundant footnotes. But even in this atmosphere of wordplay, Abu Zaid maintains his moralizing or admonishing tone. It's this understanding that poetry is supposed to kind of enrich you morally and not simply be a distraction or, or a kind of pleasure moment. Um, so addressing his grandchildren, Abu Zaid says, yes. The future is coming toward you, so remember what I am saying to you. The Islamic nation is passing through an age of weakness. Disunity plagues us, and our dignity has been threatened. But our lamps are exploding with the light of our nation's awakening, its flame ignited by our martyrs, our sons. In my poem, I bring you all good news. The Muslim's victory is coming. Whichever of you lives to see it, remember the commandments of your grandfather on that day." End quote. Abu Zaid's collection includes only one family letter poem of this kind, while Bahar's collection includes three. Abu Zaid does have two other personal, i.e. not occasional, poems. One addresses questions to God, and the other reiterates the idea that Islam, the Quran, and the community of the faithful situated in Madras Abul will help the poet endure the distance from his homeland. Bahar also has an interesting poem titled My Library, Makdabati in which he describes his love of books and implicitly longs for the library he left behind. 
All of these poems seem motivated by a humanizing or familiarizing impulse. They seek to reveal a more human or relatable side to the, these deported members of Hamas, who are often portrayed as cold-hearted terrorists. I would like to conclude with a brief note on tone, followed by a longer citation from one of Abu Zaid's poems. Where Bahar is more concerned with tropes drawn from the history of Islam and Islamic conquest, Abu Zaid composes a more narrative type of verse, one that carefully documents and archives historical events. Where Bahar focuses on the glory of Islam in the golden age of the past, Abu Zaid often takes an admonishing tone, a tone that's apparent even in his metapoetical reflections. It is with some of these reflections that I would like to close today as they provide an excellent illustration of the poetics that inform these collections. Both Bahar and Abu Zaid consider poetry not necessarily as a mode of aesthetic expression, but as a moral and historical pursuit, one meant not only to strengthen and cement their community's ties, but also to record their struggles for posterity, reintegrating their story into the larger narrative of Palestinian resistance. Um, so, right, so in a poem titled The Question of Exile, or The Question of Deportation, called the Ibaid, uh, Abu Zaid writes, quote, Remember well, be a captain in poetry, and aim for clarity and goodness in your speech. Do not go down into every valley, raving and mad with love, prisoner of a soul that sees passion as a garden. I just love this, this line because it's totally playing on the, um, like the Leila Qais image of the poet as this kind of raving lunatic who comes up with these amazing verses. He's saying, no, don't, don't let poetry be that kind of thing. Um, if you do, you will mislead those who are tempted by the beauty of words and care little for the truth. If you want the art of poetry to attain a lofty status, be a source of truth and virtue. In your work, call out for actions and sacrifices that benefit all people. Make righteousness a principle in your works, a foundation upon which buildings of spiritual guidance can be built. A true poet gives light to those living in the shadow of oppression and brings fire to their oppressors. Choose a structure for your art that is harmonious and well-ordered, as though it were a necklace of sapphires and pearls. Make your melodies skillful and full of harmony, and give life to your thoughts and conscience through your heart." End quote. These metapoetic lines serve as an excellent recapitulation of Abu Zaid's poetry collection as a whole. Rather than admonish his addressees, however, for a change Abu Zaid admonishes himself, thereby revealing what he has been attempting to do throughout the course of the collection's 14 poems. Poetry in Abu Zaid's estimation must not deceive its audience with rhetorical eloquence, quote, misleading those who are tempted by the beauty of words and distracting them from the truth. For this exiled writer who composed his verses, quote, by candlelight in a tent at night because the days were weighed down by rain and the shadows of dark clouds, end quote, the office of poetry is not to distract and delight, experimenting with new sounds and vowel patterns in the quest for new modes of aesthetic experience. It is rather to, quote, give light to those living in the shadow of oppression, end quote, rendering their stories in well-arranged words strung together, quote, like a necklace of sapphires and pearls, end quote. As these lines amply illustrate, pre-modern Arabic notions about the purpose of poetry have not disappeared in the modern period. They've simply migrated to new spaces. Thank you.